It's really an honor to be here, um, especially among such uh, incredible intellectuals that um, I can share the stage with. My job as I see it is to give you a preview in many ways of some of these differences and a few hints as to how I think about them. Uh, although I'm a neuroscientist by training, I'll talk very little about brains today. I want to just sort of give you uh, a broad sense of how I, I like to think about human uniqueness uh, in a, the sense of the problem of what a symbol is. Uh, this is a complicated problem because, in fact, we don't really have one definition of what a symbol is. And what I want to do is to try to take it apart a little bit and to talk a little bit about uh, how I think um, our unique abilities to deal with this way of referring to things uh, has changed us uh, fundamentally in comparison to other species. And I want to put it in context with a fairly simple and mundane example um, to show you that what we think about as symbols are really part of a much larger picture uh, in which they are probably the most developed and most subtly complex form of communication, of sign, so to speak. And that's using this example of a signet ring. Uh, that we use, for example, to close an envelope and identify the person who did it. There is an iconic aspect that is a part that we recognize by its likeness to something else. And that likeness becomes important at many, many stages. First of all, just simply the whole sign vehicle itself, that is the wax impression, uh, is a likeness that we've seen others like it. Uh, but there's, of course, a more fu fundamental likeness between the ring impression and the wax that was impressed by it. But we know something more about it. We know that somebody in particular did it uh, with a particular ring. And we know this because he had to be or she had to be physically connected to that mark. That's an indexical relationship. We know that this indicates, we say, that this person was there, was involved with sealing this, this note as a signature on a document. Uh, is an indication that you were physically present and part of it. It indicates it in the way that a thermostat indicates temperature. Um, however, uh, to understand the bigger message here, we need something more than just knowing about the physical features here. And what we need to know is that a person that has a ring like this is probably a special person. That the ring itself is carrying some social cultural information. Uh, what's interesting is that if you didn't know about the first two forms, uh, you couldn't really say much about this. Even if you knew cultural features like uh, kings or princes have special rings, uh, if you didn't really understand this connectivity, the iconic and indexical base, you wouldn't really understand the symbols. The symbol is, in a sense, separate from the physical sign vehicle. We often make the mistake, however, of saying, well, that means it's just arbitrary. What I'm trying to show you here is that it's not, in fact, just arbitrary. You have to know a lot about the sign vehicle, a lot about what's gone on before this. You need to know the iconic and indexical features. In talking about the origins of language, uh, I focus on this in part because we tend to think about language divorced from other forms of communication, divorced from uh, our laughter and sobbing, divorced from our facial expressions, and so on. Uh, the the point is that we have also taken the word symbol and given it interesting and not so useful second meanings. So that we often talk about typographical characters as symbols. What I want to do is to pull two things apart. The character itself, uh, like these letters on this page, are symbols in the sense that they were designed to communicate symbolically. But very quickly, if you notice this little, what's called an emoticon these days, in the first line of this, the smiley face. Uh, is made up of, quote, typographical symbols, but it doesn't refer to anything symbolically. It refers by virtue of its likeness. It's embedded in a whole symbolic uh, complex, but its reference is iconic. And one of the important things is to keep the referential piece separate from the vehicle. And one of the things that symbolic communication has done has allowed us to use other modes of communicating, other kinds of signs, uh, to communicate in a way in which the sign vehicle itself doesn't have to carry much, doesn't have to do a lot of the work. So being conventional or being invented or being even created to be symbolic, to, use, to be used for symbolic communication, like words uh, on this page are or coming out of my mouth, doesn't necessarily mean that they refer symbolically. 
I want to keep those apart because I think what's different about us is that we do symbolic reference uh, better and much more efficiently, much more rapidly than other species. Uh, here's a quick cartoon that, that I hope gives you a sense of this. On uh, the left, uh, there's this sort of network. Um, you can think about this as like a dictionary. A dictionary is a word that's mapped to other words, and each of those other words are mapped to other words. Uh, there are more complicated ways to talk about this kind of a network in terms of what we might call a lexical uh, system uh, in our brains. But basically, words have this ability to refer to other words in interesting ways. Uh, but they do so in somewhat of an isolation from the rest of the world. Uh, and one of the real problems we have, and it's been argued for generations, is how do symbols get ground to things in the world? How do they get found out in terms of how they refer to something else? And the issue there is that we have to use complicated combinations of symbols to do this. Uh, and we have to either tell people about it, or we have to have things in language that accomplish this. So to give you a sense of what I mean by this, um, uh, we need in language to have things that do iconic and indexical work. For example, um, the surface of this table is smooth, but the word smooth by itself doesn't give you any specific reference. But I could also simply do this and utter the word smooth, and you know I'm now referring to that particular surface. Uh, in effect, that's an index. It indicates something. And symbols, because they are, in a sense, just in relation to each other, need also to be indexed. They need to be linked to things in the world. Um, I won't go into the details of this, but I think this is a crucial piece of story that tells us that, in fact, um, symbols are not just arbitrary marks that can be shuffled around. There's not just any possible way to do it. They need to be embedded in a much more complex system. One of the things I think is interesting about referring to things this way is that it changes the way our memories work. And I think one of the more interesting things about us is our memories. Uh, what it means to, in effect, uh, remember something, bring something up. Um, typically, psychologists like to divide the memory systems, neuropsychologists, into what we sometimes call procedural and episodic memory. Procedural memory is the kind of skill learning memory. Episodic memory is the kind of memory that you use to find out what you had for breakfast yesterday, for example, a particular episode. The difference is that in a procedure, you can use it again and again. You repeat. To remember something well, you repeat something again and again. You do it again and again. You get on your bicycle again and again. But an episode only occurs once. And the way you have to remember that is by its relations to other things. And in fact, there have been centuries of mnemonic devices where people trying to remember details embed them in sort of episodes. The point I want to make about language and symbolic communication is that the words that we learn uh, and the syntax that we learn to put those words together um, are procedural. Um, they're habits of skills that we have. And we develop them over many, many, many years. They're procedural memories in a sense that you don't have to think about any more than I have to think about what foot to put on my bicycle first uh, when I get up. Um, uh, however, the meanings of those words uh, and how they refer to things in the world are much more associated with episodes, things that have gone on, individual events. Basically, what language has done is it's allowed these two memory systems to work together. We use words and syntax to sample the episodes in our past. We can use those episodes then to lead to new storylines. In effect, the way I like to think about it is that symbols have given us narrative. Um, until we had a way to represent in this way, we were not having, a, in a sense, a narrative of our life to rely upon. We human beings live every moment in a kind of self-narrative. And what I want to suggest is this is something unique. It's not language per se, but language has certainly become the crucial basis for this. Um, we remember things differently. Um, I don't think of myself here and now with an audience in front of me. I think of myself um, at some point in a story, you might say. That, I think, is a unique feature that symbols have provided. Um, another thing, and this is a, the cover of a book uh, that was published, not surprisingly, in Berkeley called Why Cats Paints. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, my favorite part, by the way, is uh, why cats sculpt toward the end of it. They always sculpt in furniture. You probably know this. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I want to get at here is I want to just sort of broaden this story out because many of the speakers after me are also going to talk about some of these issues. Um, it's not just uh, thinking and symbolic processes that have been changed by this process. And I think one of the important things to think about is why we find things like painting interesting, why we find manipulation of color interesting, or forms, and so on. I want to give you a, a sense of this using a couple of um, links to this icon index symbol kind of logic, uh, just, just to sort of tantalize you a little bit. Icons, of course, are pictures. They bring to mind similar things. So the picture of the woman and her baby brings to mind a particular relationship, maybe some specific events in your past, a child playing with toys, or a marionette here. Each of these doesn't, in a sense, tell you anything new, so to speak. It might be the first time you've seen this picture, but it brings to mind other things. But what about this picture? Um, this is the cover of a New Yorker magazine. Looking closely at it, you realize it's got all these same parts, but they're juxtaposed in weird ways. And as a result, their discontinuities, in effect, point to each other. They indicate each other. They indicate something is wrong. And as you look at this, um, I want you to think you began to laugh right at the beginning because in many ways, we look right through these. We look through it not to see a puppet and a baby and a mother. Um, we see it's commenting about something. What is it about? That's what we're interested in. We're interested in this sort of general symbolic background. Uh, but it's using these icons and indices in juxtaposition to get us there. We find this very common, and I, I like to use artistic examples. Uh, the one on the left, of course, is a comment about something. It's not, the, it's not a city. It's not a ruin. Uh, it's a comment about something. We don't see it for what it is. We see it um, for something that's behind it, so to speak, that it points us to. As most political cartoons, of course, do this very commonly, use odd juxtapositions that themselves carry meaning, sometimes cultural meaning. But it's the configuration, the picture, and how the contradictions or the symbols within them, how they point to each other and so on, that lead us to a meaning that's behind it. I want to use a concept that's been developed by people both here uh, and elsewhere, a concept called conceptual blending, to talk a little bit about how using symbols has changed this way of thinking. Now, uh, there's other ways to do it, but here's the, the depiction I want you to take away. The bottom part of this is about com conceptual blends. The two clouds towards the bottom are meant to represent uh, basically two symbolic ideas, perhaps uh, pictures, uh, perhaps words, perhaps phrases, uh, perhaps events. Um, what's going on here in a conceptual blend is that you basically see their relationships to each other. You link their components to each other in various ways. Uh, and the picture down below shows that, in a sense, you get a blended image as a result. Lots of ways that we use to think about the past, what could have been, what might have been. Um, things that don't exist oftentimes can be thought about in these sort of blending terms. But what I want to point out is that oftentimes symbols, like the ones I just showed you, various pictures, come with an emotional tone as well. There is some attachment we have to mothers and to babies, for example, and to puppets, and to what puppetry might mean indirectly. Um, each of them carries an emotional feature as well. So when you blend symbols, when you blend images, when they juxtapose in various ways, you are also incidentally blending emotional states. Um, not in the same sense that you would as when you encounter a direct interaction with someone that drives up an emotion. It's, it's a much weaker version of it, but it's a juxtaposition. And the way I like to look at it in terms of how the brain is working, and I won't go into any detail about this, but it, that in fact we have very different parts of our brain that are involved in the positive, generating positive emotions and negative emotions. And what that means is that if a particular juxtaposition um, uh, allows us uh, to bring together these emotions, what we've got in effect is what I would call an emergent emotion. An emotion that normally we wouldn't have, um, but can be brought together in unusual ways. And I like to think that, in effect, that a joke does this sort of thing. Uh, what does a joke do? It brings together juxtaposing things that are mutually exclusive. 
And as you follow the punchline, is that um, you're led down a sort of garden path and suddenly something changes. Um, that other meaning was possibly there, but hidden, as the one up on the far right, the little green sort of empty cloud up there. Uh, but when the punchline is given, or when you figure out what it means, suddenly the one meaning is tossed out and the other meaning comes in. That is, one emotion, as I show it down here, in a sense has to be suddenly shut off. One tension has to be suddenly shut off. The other one comes to life. This is a very sudden event, and it's a very intense event. Um, similarly, when we have an aesthetic experience, oftentimes it's because of a juxtaposition as well. Um, and uh, that juxtaposition is one that maybe doesn't ever resolve. So what I want to suggest here is that these capabilities didn't just change our cognition, didn't just give us language and logic and science. They actually change some very deep things about us. Um, they give us um, what I think is a unique emotional world to live in, um, a unique set of experiences, and what's quite surprising is that these are experiences that we love, that we seek out. This kind of juxtaposition, this kind of use of symbols to manipulate our experience is, I think, one of the hallmarks of being human. Thank you.